everybody. I'm so excited to be here in Brazil and at this conference to start everything off. Let's get started. Oh, let's go back. There we go. Okay, so my talk today is about something you're very familiar with, feijoada and work culture. Um, before we get to that, I just want to say thank you for being so welcoming to me in Brazil. I'm having an amazing time. This place is beautiful. The food is awesome, but the best part is the people, all you guys. So thank you for being amazing hosts. How does everybody feel about doing a warm-up? I know you had a lot of fun last night. I saw the food trucks. I saw the little pillows on the floor. Are you guys all cool with a warm-up? Awesome. So I have a couple of models over here, other speakers, Cynthia and Rob. They're going to model for us. And we're going to do a little warm-up exercise. So this is what we're going to do. I think we're probably going to break some kind of world record by doing this in this setting. Um, I'm going to ask you to remain silent throughout this exercise. Thumbs up if you agree to that. Awesome. OK, if you can, stand up. Rock on. Now, find one partner next to you and give them a high five. Great. OK, there you go. Good job, models. OK. so. I'm going to yell out two words, which are pairs of things, and without talking, one in the pair should act as one of the things, and the other in the pair should act as the other one of those things. So the models are going to show initially how this works, and we're going to start off with fork and knife. Fork and knife. Very good. Okay, now all of you try this out. Fork and knife. Killing it. Awesome. Okay, we're going to continue on. Ready for more? Dog and cat. Dog and cat. No talking. No talking. <laughs> Laughing is fine. Okay. Wine and cheese. Wine and cheese. You guys are just killing it. Brazil's the best. Okay. Bee and flower. Bee and flower. I really want to see these flowers. Oh, these bees. Active bees here in Floripa. Okay. Hammer and nail. Hammer and nail. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You guys are just amazing. Sun and moon. Sun and moon. Wow. OK. And the last and my favorite one, I'm going to do it with you, sprinkler and lawn. Awesome. You guys killed it. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you, models. Awesome. So now we're going to get back to business or was that business? Hmm. Let's get to that. So I'm going to tell you first about my career story, um, which is a little bit different than probably many of yours. I started off as a lawyer. I worked as a lawyer, and I just found it to be a little bit negative and a little bit boring. I just didn't really want to go to work every day when I was a lawyer. So I kind of reverted to a passion, which was, of course, money, no, higher education, and working at a university. And I worked as a fundraiser for UC Berkeley and for University of California, San Francisco. And I found it to be very motivating to work for a university. I was making good things happen in the world. However, you know, I, I was in Silicon Valley. I was in San Francisco, and I had all these friends working for these really cool Silicon Valley companies, and I wanted to see what it was like inside those companies. I was just really, really curious. Um, I started using design thinking to innovate a lot of my programs, and I said, you know what, I'm just going to bite the bullet, I'm going to jump in and move over to Silicon Valley. So I joined this place called Cooper. And I now lead up marketing, I do service design, I help them with their university projects, um, and I get to oversee their culture. And I really have gotten to know what makes Silicon Valley companies tick, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. A little more about Cooper in case it's new to you. Cooper is a design and strategy consulting firm. We also have a training arm. We are the North American arm of Design It, which is a strategic design firm on four continents. And our whole goal as Cooper is to transform organizations to make them more innovative and make them more impactful. So let me share a little bit about how my old world felt compared to my new world. 
my old world was like this. I worked in this old house. I had a big office with a big door, and it was very private. I had nice furniture. It was really cool. I went to my interview at Cooper, and it looked like that. And I was like, whoa, those people are cool. But Alan Cooper is sitting out there without, a, you know, without an office. What's going on? It was very confusing for me. My old office, we looked really good. We dressed in nice clothes. We had ties. The, w the women wore stockings. Everything was more formal, more conservative. Somebody once got sent home on a Thursday at my old office for wearing jeans. Then I got to Cooper, and everybody wears jeans all the time and T-shirts. It was, again, startling for me. I was shocked. What's going on? When there were events outside of work at UCSF, it would always involve a celebrity and champagne. It was always some kind of gala, very fancy. That's me with Christy Yamaguchi. Things were fun. Then I came to Cooper. We're playing dodgeball. We're wearing fake tattoos. I was like, this place is crazy. So let me tell you what this talk is about. This talk is about creating a culture conducive to innovation. And it's about more than those initial impressions. Innovation is about, or the way I define it, using Scott Berkham's definition, significant positive change. So whenever I say innovation today, that's what I mean. Significant positive change. And why does it matter? It matters because innovation is going to be a top driver of business growth in the next three to five years, period. So if you want to profit, you want to grow, you want to succeed, your only choice is innovation. Innovative companies in Silicon Valley, they make their culture look really easy. I saw that. I experienced that. I thought, okay, cat t-shirt, beanbag chair, free snacks, done. Actually, it's not like that at all. It's a very complicated calculus. There's a lot of nuance to it. It's extremely intentional. And so what I'm going to do today is take you through nine steps that Silicon Valley companies do to become innovative. And I'm going to use Cooper as sort of a backstage tour to show you what that looks like. And I'm going to use something very familiar to you, the national dish of Brazil, feijoada. And I'm, I love feijoada. I've loved it before I came to Brazil. It's even better here. So feijoada is going to be a metaphor. And I'm going to show you through each step how, a matrix with each step, how to make feijoada and an innovative culture. A couple caveats. Every feijoada is unique and special. Today, I'm going to show you the behind the scenes at Cooper's feijoada recipe. So you're going to see a lot about my company because that's what I know. We'll talk about some other companies as well, but this is really the focus of today. I learned about innovation from the leaders of Cooper, my mentors, Alan and Sue Cooper. They're awesome. If you came to ISA last year in Chile, Alan was a closing keynote. And truly, their DNA and their intentionality around innovation is what creates an amazingly innovative culture for Cooper. Sue is the heart of the company. Sue is just full of love and hugs and authenticity. She is just dripping with empathy. So our culture reflects that. She expects it. She embodies that sort of experience at Cooper. Alan, on the other hand, is just big personality. He is always challenging authority. He is always taking risks. He expects us to question things hard. If you don't at Cooper, you're not going to succeed there. So Alan's DNA is very much a part of the co uh, company as well. This picture really reflects the shared DNA of Alan and Sue and their influence on the company. So the expectation that they embody in the company is one that's really fun, really huggy and collaborative and authentic, but also questioning and very much about pushing the envelope, thinking outside the box, really approaching things in new ways. So I implore you to, number one, look for companies where there are leaders that embody these sorts of characteristics. That's something that you should think about when you're working at a company or looking for a new job. But also, I want each of you to think about the characteristics that you want to embody for innovation that you can use to influence other people. Moving on to the next element of, of your feijoada are the beans. And beans are super important to feijoada. It's not feijoada without beans. Beans are the base of the feijoada. They take up most of the pot. They complement, they support, they balance the meat and the other elements. 
The beans mean the team. And the team at Cooper is so cool. We really look for people that have amazing skills in UX, of course, that's a given. We look for people who are nice, who embody those Sioux characteristics that I mentioned before. But actually, the secret sauce are the next two things I'm going to talk about. One of the elements of the secret sauce is the diversity of perspectives. When you're hiring, I implore you to think about hiring people that have non-traditional backgrounds. People like me, who was a lawyer two years ago, is now working in design. We have people who are farmers, like Alan, or dancers, people who are neuroscientists. And we believe that these different brains, these different mental models, are what makes for innovation in our, in our organization. Additionally, there are certain soft skills or traits that we find among innovative employees. They include emotional intelligence, being self-aware. We look for these skills. Are people self-aware? Do they understand themselves? Do they improve from failure? Do they embrace failure? Do their merits speak to them for themselves? Are they humble? Do they, do they actually just do good work and let the work show their success? At the same token, do they under-promise and then over-deliver? Do they set expectations at the right level? Do they know what they don't know, and then they learn what they don't know? And I hope all of you, I think all of you embody this. And last, if they get stuck, they know when to ask for help. And that's a really important thing. Don't let yourself get stuck. Move beyond getting stuck. So how do we test for this at Cooper? We have a four-round interview process, okay, when we're bringing people on. The first round, we're just looking for their UX skills. Are they good? Check. Okay. Are they nice people? Then we look at that. Fantastic. The third thing is, do they add an element of diversity? Do they have a passion or another kind of approach that they can bring to add new brains? Great. The last day, the fourth day, we ask people to take a day off of work, spend the whole day with us. They, we put them on a project team, and we see how they embody all those characteristics. Are they self-aware? Do they understand their limitations? Are they humble? When, when they do that, that's when we know we want to hire them and they're a fit. And this is what Silicon Valley companies do. Moving along, beans and meat alone would be kind of boring without other elements and feijoada, am I right? You need other stuff. So we're going to talk about how do you get to other stuff. It's through a recipe. I wouldn't know how to make feijoada without one. Why is a recipe important? One, it serves as a guide so you kind of know where you're headed. Two, it prevents wasted resources, ingredients, time, and money. I'm not going to go out and buy things that I don't need. Three, it instills confidence in your process. That's very important. Recipes represent making data-driven decisions. And as designers, we can often be very qualitative, and qualitative data is fantastic, but I implore you to also think about quantitative data when you make decisions about your company. Why make data-driven decisions? Two reasons. One, it's everywhere. It's at our fingertips. It's available to us. It's silly not to. Two, performance. Companies that are data-driven perform better on every objective measure. So if you want to perform well, you got to make data-driven decisions. I'm going to tell you a story about a Cooperista. Um, we call ourselves Cooperistas, by the way. Um, his name is Ross, and he's a recent college graduate. He was an engineering major, so he has that left-brained mind. And we hired him to do marketing for our education arm. So we teach these public classes. We need to fill the classes. And we market it through largely social media. So Ross asked me for a huge, what I thought, a huge budget to do Twitter ads. We'd never really done Twitter ads before. So instead of saying no, we don't say no at Cooper. We say yes and. Instead of saying no, I said, hey, why don't we do a little test? I'm going to give you a couple hundred dollars, and I want you to test things out. I want you to test images. So he went back and looked at all the tweets that we had done in the past and looked up all the images, which one performed well, which ones didn't. I asked him to test words, which words performed well, which didn't. From these, this work, he started to do all these tests. He optimized the language, the pictures, and he showed results. With the same amount of spend, some of the optimized ads were getting 2,200 impressions, while the non-optimized ads, like the ones we had been doing, were getting 173. So that actually 
gave us confidence. It allowed us to invest significantly more in Twitter ads, which truly, it sounds silly, changed the face of our business. Actually, it increased our class sizes significantly. The results were amazing. Seven times the average engagement on Twitter from doing this. 50% reduction on, on cost per click. And we discovered all these new, relevant, high value audiences. And those are a couple examples at the bottom of these optimized ads. And the best part about it is Ross is no longer an intern. He is Ross the employee. So when you do this sort of work, when you bring this analytical mindset to bear, it, it shows great results. The next element of feijoada, the one that I really enjoy, is black pepper. Black pepper is intense. It's spicy, and it's full of character. Black pepper represents risk. You do not have innovation or an innovative environment if there is no risk. Risk, I define as trying something that may not work. My favorite proverb around risk is a Chinese one. Pearls do not lie on the seashore. If you want one, you must die for it. So you are not going to get to that new thing. You are not going to find an uncharted path unless you are willing to take risk. The biggest business mistake you will ever make is not to take a risk. So another story. At Cooper, we have this professional development arm. We offer these really high touch personal classes with coaches. They're awesome. People love it. We, we trained about 10,000 people this way for 17 years, and we decided that's how we were going to do it forever. We don't believe in online learning. We wanted it to be really personal and connected. So business plan for 2017 said that. Not very innovative. Moving along, Udemy. How many of you know Udemy? Yeah, oh yeah, okay, good. So Udemy is an online purveyor of, of courses. And they approached us and they said, hey Cooper, we like your classes, we like your methodology, we would like to offer a class in conjunction with you that we'll curate. It's gonna take a lot of time, a lot of effort. And we were just perplexed. We said, wait, it's not in our business plan, but you know, this is a really special opportunity. Should we do this? Should we go in this new direction? So this is what we did to decide. We said, team that's implicated, come together. I was there. So we came together and we had a gut check. We said, in your body, like viscerally, did, did this feel right? That was the first thing. The second thing we said was, okay, innovation. We need to develop new skills and capabilities. Will this allow us to develop new skills and capabilities? Yes, we wanna up-level our video. We want to up-level our storytelling. It creates a recipe for us. It creates a new data point to try future decisions. So while this is a pretty big test that took a lot of effort, it did create a data point for us. And it created a new revenue stream. So actually it was revenue positive. So we thought of all of those things. We knew it would take a lot of work and we did it. This is Sanskriti, my colleague. It, it was a Herculean effort. It was really, really intense to decide to do this. But it, it, we, we found all of those things that we looked at happened. We actually have a storytelling class that came out of this. Out of this, we are doing more videos. It changed the course of our business. So taking this risk actually led to innovation. We are now in the business of offering online courses when we weren't before because we took a risk. There was not data that supported this. We didn't know if it would work for us, but we did it and we were very proud. So you can see here, 4.5 rating, 4,000 students in the last five months. Moving along, the next key element of feijoada is garlic. And what is it about garlic? Let's talk about garlic. Garlic is sharp, it's pungent, and it's in your face. Garlic represents radical candor. Raise your hand if you know about radical candor. Cool, I'm excited. Okay, radical candor is a way that people in Silicon Valley and at Cooper relate to each other. This is the way that we're expected to talk to each other, the way that we give feedback. And it means challenging directly and caring personally about your colleagues. A little bit like Alan and Sue. Nick is my boss. He's the CEO of Cooper, and he is the ultimate representative of radical candor. 
And he asked me to create a marketing plan. And so I came from UCSF where I was the man and I created this really cool plan. It was long, it was really well written, there were pie charts, there were bar graphs, it was great, I thought. And sat down with Nick and he was like, I don't know about that. And he shared with me a bunch of feedback. He said, hey, Andrew, listen, um, I really don't think that the plan you created is going to socialize well in a design firm, especially a design firm that's skeptical about marketing. He said, it needs to be higher level, more visual, more synthesized, something like this. And I was, you know, I thought about it and I was like, hey, Nick, I really appreciated the way you gave that feedback. And what I learned was it turned me from being kind of turned off to feeling really motivated and really productive. And I said, I want to learn how to do that. So I started studying radical candor. Here's the steps. This is how you do radical candor. H-H-I-I-P-P. -P. First, you gotta be humble. So Nick didn't yell at me. Nick wasn't mean. He was super nice. And he was just humble. He just said things from a calm place. So that's the first thing, is have that right tone. Secondly, it was helpful. He's like, I want you to succeed. I want this thing to socialize well within the organization. So that was a really important part of the feedback that he offered. Next, it was immediate. He didn't stew on it. I didn't have to worry and wait and think, does he like it? What is he really thinking? It was immediate. It's in person. And I know a lot of you work with people around the world. I do too. Better to do it on video chat. Don't do it on text. Don't do it on email. Okay, because it's a really easy to misconstrue. Don't do it on Facebook either. Um, also, when you're giving criticism, always do it privately. And I know this is obvious, but remember that. Make this a rule for yourself because the biggest way you're going to lose respect and confidence from your staff is if you criticize somebody in public. So criticism should always be one-on-one. -on -one, but of course, if you have nice things to say, say it to everybody. Last. Nick and I are buddies. We go out for food in New York and San Francisco. It is not about personality. He always gives us feedback no matter what. Do not let personality get in the way. Do not let your friendship get in the way. That will get in the way of innovation. Radical candor equals results. This is why we do it. Companies that, that focus on honest feedback and open communication have a 10-year shareholder return that's 270% higher than companies that don't. So again, if you want to innovate, if you want to succeed, if you want to grow, if you want to profit, this is the way to do it. Biggest thing, though, is hierarchy. You can't have it. Radical candor has to flow in every single direction. So Ross gives Nick, the intern guy, gives Nick, the CEO, direct feedback. You know why he can do it? It's because he does it out of a place of respect. He does it because he wants Nick to be successful. He wants the company to be successful. And Nick doesn't think Ross is doing a good job unless he gives him that kind of feedback. So there's an expectation within Silicon Valley, within Cooper, to give feedback in this way. Moving along, the next element of feijoada, bay leaves. I don't know about you, it's hard to describe bay leaves. I really don't know how to do it. Bay leaves are mysterious to me. They're kind of complex. They're multifaceted. There's, you know, break them, you smell them. They're kind of unique. To me, they represent learning. And learning constantly is really important to innovation. According to Pew, people crave learning. 73% of people consider themselves to be lifelong learners. It makes you more confident. 87% of people feel that learning made them feel more capable and well-rounded. And it feeds innovation. 69% feel that learning opened up new perspectives. So first of all, congratulations. You're all here. You're learning. You're already doing this. You're ahead of the curve. So how do we do learning at a place like Cooper and in Silicon Valley? We have this easy thing. You might want to borrow it. It's called the Cooper Exchange. Every Friday, we invite Cooperistas to learn something totally different and new. It's one hour. You don't have to go. We give a free lunch, it's live, there's a webinar. Who presents? Anybody can present. Sometimes it's a Cooperista, sometimes it's a friend or a family member, sometimes we bring clients and partners or people we meet in the world. Here's some examples. We did a virtual reality session where we actually brought in virtual reality gaming and learned all about how that happens. We brought in an astrologer who came and talked about horoscopes and we learned about tarot cards. It was really, really cool and interesting. 
we brought in somebody from an adjacent field to do a lecture on video game design. And we learned how our, our kind of brothers and sisters in video game design do their work. We brought Lalo Gonzalez, who I think is here. Are you here? He, I met him at last year's ISA. He came by San Francisco and he taught us about his amazing nonprofit, uh, which helps women to learn how to code and do UX around South America. We brought in an animator. I mean, the list goes on. We have a uh, cryptocurrency. I mean, we're learning something new every week. And you know, how does it spark innovation? It keeps people engaged. It keeps people engaged in the, in the company. It makes them excited to be there. It exposes them to fresh new perspectives. It gives people new ways of thinking, but more importantly, it actually inspires our work product all the time. Every week we're learning something new and actually we apply it at work. I'll tell you a story of how we do that. Shannon is a director of UX at Cooper and she was working on a project that required a lifetime journey map and she was super intimidated by it. She was thinking, I've done you know, journey maps for experiences lasting a minute or an hour, maybe a week, but a lifetime? How the heck am I going to do that? So we had a Cooper exchange that was about board game design. And the presenter was talking about Monopoly, the game of life, and Shannon had this huge spark of inspiration. She said, I'm going to create a lifetime journey map, which I've never done before, based on the game of life. So she went home, kind of like me in an animation, typing, 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 you know, designing, 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 and she created this amazing journey map, which actually landed so well. The story landed well, the format landed well, and we've actually landed a bunch of projects requiring lifetime journey maps as a result of that random Cooper exchange on board game design. So this actually translates to results. Number seven, orange slices. I mean, orange slices are awesome because they're sweet and juicy and zesty and full of color. They represent fun. And you got to have fun. There is not going to be innovation in your company if you're not having fun. So Jack Welsh, he's the meat, formerly, of GE, says that fun has to be a big element in your business strategy. Business is ideas and fun and excitement and celebrations. Take a picture of this, show it to your boss. you got to do fun. You are not going to have innovation in your companies if you don't do fun. I'm going to show you a video. Every year at Cooper, we take two days, fly everybody from around the country to just spend time together and have fun. The company invests in two days of fun. We don't talk about anything heavy. We just play games. I'm going to show you this video so you can get a taste of it. I think people are really afraid to play. And I think, um, well, I think people are afraid to just mess up. We don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Getting everybody in a group and having them stand up and move their bodies. Just, just moving is something that you don't do in a board room. These days we know that in our work we want to be innovative. We want to be courageous. We want to collaborate and be curious in what we do and not be free. Instead, celebrate them and push through. And play is an incredible way to flex those muscles and actually get us in that state that's going to make us more productive. It's going to make us closer to the ones we love and the ones we work with, too. Today we played icebreakers, name games, throwing a whoosh one direction and then the other direction, and then it sort of builds on that. It was cool to see, like, one minor gesture just really evolve and and take on something completely different. We're playing games, the kind of games where you learn stuff about other people and about yourself. Today we did a collaborative art project where we all carved out stamps and put them all together in one big beautiful mural. We are doing little sketches of, of turtles into a rubber block. Today we took a beautiful walk across this land. So we actually walked around the farm, collected um, flowers and uh, branches and made beautiful bouquets. Today we played, connected, and got to know each other better. We're having fun. Yeah. <laughs> That's really what it is. Just spending some time getting away from work, having fun, and just uh, exploring spending time together. 
I don't know, it's kind of like hitting the refresh button. Like when you power off a computer and turn it back on, it kind of refreshes or re-energizes you. It totally normalized risk. Um, you know, if all of us are doing something silly together, it's um, a lot more fun and easy than if one person is kind of going outside of their comfort zone. It starts with trusting yourself and getting along with each other. And so this is, this is vital stuff. Yeah, we were normalizing risk and just having a good time, and I think, you know, we needed that. There we go. So yeah, we don't get to do two days of fun all the time, and it's gonna be hard to convince your, your, your uh, supervisors maybe to do that right away, but there's ways to bake in fun every single day. So this is the finance manager and I, we go out for bubble tea like three days a week for 15 minutes, and it's such an amazing way for us to press the reset button, feel refreshed, feel connected, and actually go back to work with a new perspective. The improv game that we did before, yes, that is business. You did business. We do that every single Monday. It's a huge part of our business strategy to do improv, normalizing risk. And sometimes we actually dread it. We actually go into it and say, I don't feel like it. It's like exercise. After you do it, you always feel better. And so I really recommend learning about improv. It is a fantastic way to get to innovation and think in new ways and bond with your team. We play games with our students in our classes. So actually, we have them when they get there, they don't know each other, they draw a picture of each other for three minutes at the same time, and then we put up a gallery on it, and they love it. They take pictures of it, they feel really excited. During a project, during a project, we were feeling really stressed out, so we went to an inflatables museum. We literally went to an inflatables museum, my, my project uh, team and I, and we told our client, and the client loved it. The client was like, that is awesome. And you know what, we went back, and we brought the fun to the client. The client was from a bureaucratic, more conservative, hierarchical company, and we said, no, 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 that's not the way we do business. We started doing body storming with them, improv, and they have changed their organizational structure. They actually do business totally differently based on that experience. Moving along, what you serve the feijoada in matters too. It affects the flavor of it, the environment, the pot matters. So from a Stanford study on workplace design, there's three tips about creating an environment, an office, a workplace that's conducive to innovation. One, you want close proximity. You want people to be close to each other. Okay, that's really, really important. You want to maximize the encounters that people have with each other. Two, everybody works differently. Some of you are introverts. Some of you are extroverts. Some of you need quiet. Some of you like loud. This is where the bean bags come into play. That's why there's bean bags. You need different kinds of spaces that conjure up different types of thoughts. It's very important to have some private offices, a lot of open space, but you need people to be cross, crossing paths like the first point. Number three, personalization is super duper important. Organizations should encourage employees to bring their stuff to the office, to bring their artifacts, their physical features, things that are meaningful for them. That's gonna increase people's engagement and conjure up different ways of thinking. Here's a tour of the Cooper office, some of the ways that we do it. We have a big chalkboard. Every week, we put up a prompt. Sometimes it's a super silly prompt, like what's your favorite condiment? Sometimes you say, you know, what's your favorite book? Sometimes it's a design question. You know, what's, what is up with personas? And people will write, you know, different responses to that. And we'll invite our community to write on it. We'll invite our clients to write on it. It's an asynchronous, really cool way to all feel invested and get together. We moved to a new office recently and we had these new conference rooms. Instead of naming the conference rooms based on something rote or having that decision come from the CEO, from Alan or from Nick, really we made it a big activity. We had everybody involved in naming the conference rooms. We had workshops. It was super fun, super cool. And we came up with doing San Francisco or Bay Area inventions. Important things like the bendy straw and the popsicle. 
And it's actually become something that people feel really invested in. When people go to the conference rooms, they feel connected to it. The visual design team at Cooper got super excited about it and created these iconic posters that now sit around the office. And so whenever people are going to meetings now, they feel, again, more connected. We have a rotating art wall. So we have a wall where we have artists on staff. So why not take advantage of the art that they, show, that they produce? So they bring their art. People have art collections. We show their art. People see that and they feel, again, more connected, more inspired, and they feel more excited to produce in interesting new ways. So in general, the way Silicon Valley environments are innovative are as follows. One, they promote dialogue and participation. So just like that chalkboard wall, there's opportunities for back and forth, for conversation, for communication. Two, there's a lack of hierarchy. Just like those initial photos I showed you, there's no house with a big door and a big office. There are few, if any, dedicated offices. Everybody's out there together. That, just like I showed you with radical candor, that promotes people feeling like they can share with each other on a regular basis and constantly give feedback. Visibility. People can generally see their colleagues. Very important. Art, which inspires creativity. One pro tip is from a place called Planet Labs, super cool place that makes like spaceships and satellites. They have an artist in residence who's a full-time employee who sits there and creates art all the time. And the rocket scientist people go and just watch them and get inspired. It's super, super cool. And art is a really important part of innovation. And last, there's always diverse and dynamic activities happening. For example, yoga, improv, workshops, all kinds of projects, all kinds of things are happening all the time. Diverse and dynamic activity absolutely leads to innovation. Continuing on to the final, but one of the most important points is if your mom cooks your feijoada, if your uncle cooks your feijoada, if your little brother cooks a feijoada, it's gonna taste different, and the cook matters. I love watching cooking shows, watching cooks, because they take pride in their work, they own the process from beginning to end, and they add their own unique flair to it. Cooks represent ownership, and ownership is so essential to innovation. It is a big part of the Silicon Valley culture. In Drive, the author Daniel Pink defines autonomy as the desire to direct our own lives. And a study conducted at a business school in England says 78% of employees view autonomy as important to them. So if you want to retain these awesome, innovative people with all those traits I mentioned, you got to give them autonomy. And it has a positive effect, of course, on creativity and productivity. So I really recommend intentionally promoting autonomy. So this is the best example of autonomy in action that I could find is my colleague, Nate Clinton. He's the managing director of Cooper San Francisco. And Nate, about a year and a half ago, became totally transfixed with conversational interfaces, okay, Alexas. And we had no practices in this area. He said, this is the future of our discipline, and this is the future of Cooper. So what did, he, what did this look like? What did he do to manifest this? One. He became an expert. He said, I'm going to become an expert. He figured out what he didn't know, and then he learned it. He read and read and read. He made friends with all these experts, started reaching out to them. He wrote about conversational UI. He drafted a strategy. He had a plan. He created a recipe. He subscribed leaders and colleagues. He got us all. He got me involved. I got excited. He created a partnership. He realized what, where we had a gap. He realized where we, you know, where we needed to go, and he partnered with a development firm. We set up Alexa Skills, Google Homes all over the office, and then he started speaking like this. First, internally, he gave a, speak, a talk at the Cooper Exchange, then at a meetup in San Francisco, then in Chicago at a conference, then a keynote in Bangalore, and on and on and on. Now, if you Google Nate Clinton, he's a big name in, in conversational UI, and we just saw it happen because he took ownership. 
And last but not least, it has led to a new practice. We have one consulting project after the other on chatbots, on, on all these aspects. One that's really cool where you move your hand and it turns on the light. So we are doing all kinds of amazing work in this realm because Nate took ownership. And Cooper encouraged all of this. So Nate was encouraged by Nick. He was encouraged by Alan. This, it is not part of his job description to start a new practice. But he actually said, you know what, I want to do this, and this was embraced. And this has changed the face of our business. Remember, this is about innovation. This actually changed our business. We, are, we have a new business strategy because of this ownership. So how does ownership exactly lead to innovation? Three things. One, it's a motivator. If you own something, if you own your house, you're going to take better care of it. If you own something, you are going to work harder, you're going to work better, you're going to put your heart and soul into it. Ownership in, it leads to customization. If you own something, you're going to really customize it. It's going to have your own personality. It's not going to feel just standard. That, again, leads to innovation. And last, it turns work into passion. And there's nothing better that you could possibly do than have people who are passionate about what you're doing, who make a connection between your company and things they care about deeply. There's no way that you're going to get better work out of people than this. So, in review, there are nine keys that I know of to a great feijoada and an innovative culture. The first being the meat. You need to have leadership at the organization who buys into it, and you all need to be those leaders who buy into it as well, okay? So you need to embody those traits, and you need to be open to all the things we talk about after this. Two, when you compile your team, when you recruit new people, you need to look for those traits of innovation and diversity of thinking. You want people with different brains. You want people who just think and, and, and perceive things different than you do. Three, you want a recipe. You want to know where you're headed. You want to take advantage of the data that's out there to make decisions that you can feel confident about that can move you quickly. Four, black pepper. You need to take a risk. You, you have to be open to failure because there is no way that you are going to go down an uncharted path unless you do. Five, garlic. You need that in-your-face, pungent, direct feedback, but that comes from a place of caring. You know, garlic's good for you. Number six, bay leaves. Learning. You need to have an environment where you're constantly learning, where you're having your beans just constantly refreshed with new tastes and new ideas. Number seven, those orange slices, those zesty, colorful, sweet orange slices, fun. You, th none of this is happening if you're not having fun. So whether it's a two-day retreat or it's bubble tea for 15 minutes, you got to have fun. Number eight, the environment. The pot that you put your feijoada in is going to affect its flavor. You need to make sure that you have the right pot to host your fe feijoada because that is going to create the best thing possible. And number nine, and probably the most important, is you need to give your people ownership. You need to get the, a cook and give them all the tools that they need to succeed and allow them to be their best creative, innovative selves. So for now, obrigado. I want to know your fish water secrets, and I want to thank you for your wonderful attention. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for the, uh, all this explanation. I think it's really great. And I would like to know also, because since this is a process of innovation, you have tried and tested a lot of things, I guess. And in this process, have you had some kind of mistakes? And what have you learned from it? Yeah, so we, we, we've definitely made mistakes, and we always learn from them, which is why we try to test, in general, as much as we can. We try to really... I think design is largely about planning. We try to zoom out from things as much as, as possible and anticipate what are the things that could potentially happen when we, when we take risks within the business. So we spend a lot of time backing up, zooming out, thinking about essentially you know, mistakes that could, or things that could happen. Um, but we also, again, try to limit exposure, limit risk through testing. So we, do, we, we for example, try to strategy. Um, I work in business development through LinkedIn essentially. And so we started doing outreach through LinkedIn. Um, instead of spending a lot of 
finances on ads for LinkedIn and, and putting a lot of time into it, we tested with a really small sliver and we found that it didn't work. So we actually switched the strategy and moved on to a new one. So we always try to test things out, extract them into small bunches and then move forward and iterate the strategy and build off of it from there. Thank you. Próxima pergunta, rapidinho, que a gente está meio atrasadinho, então, quanto melhor. Não vai dar para fazer todas as perguntas, estou vendo muitas mãos levantadas. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Thanks for that uh, nice talk. Thank Regards you. from a design new colleague. Thank you. And I want, I want to, to ask you about um, if you feel worried about this kind of um, sensation that, that the way of work you have in Cooper that keeps people fun, engaged, lots of communication, talking. I feel like in a relaxed mood, works against that uh, pushing of startups that they work 24-7 towards their idea and they go get to market earlier. I mean, how do you feel about that, that, that consultancy, relaxing way of living against startups? Thank you. I, I, thank you very much. I actually think it's a great question. And I really think there's a way that you can carve out even those 15 minutes of fun. I, I, I really think it's important to know. It's kind of like a minute of meditation will go a really, really long way to bake into your day whenever you have a moment. Even if you're working in a startup, you know, 22 hours a day, you can find those 10 minutes to just take a break. Because if you don't take a break, it's going to be very, very hard for you to anticipate risks. It's going to be hard for you to think in creative new ways. So I think it's very important to really bake into your regimen, even if it's just for a few minutes a day, a focus on creativity and fun and just, you know, and if, if it's, maybe it's on public transportation, maybe it's when you're taking a shower in the morning, whatever it is, you have to be intentional, intentional about creating that fun or I think, I think it'll be very hard to get to creativity. I think it'll be very hard to create a product or service that's fun if you're not having fun yourself. Próxima. Última pergunta. Oi. Hi. Muito obrigada pela sua palestra. Obrigada pelo carinho com a metáfora em relação à feijoada, que ficou bem interessante. E a minha pergunta é relacionada a como que você se sente com a velocidade da mudança que aconteceu na tua vida. É, é, quero dizer, dois anos atrás você não trabalhava com isso, hoje você trabalha. E como que você lida com a velocidade das informações, a relação com os seus colegas, como que as pessoas te veem, e qual, como, como que você lida com as conexões e as entregas rápidas que você tem que fornecer, é, não só pela velocidade, mas pela quantidade de coisas. Quais os conselhos que você nos dá? <risos> Obrigada. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it, it's, it's a great question. And I could say that, honestly, my old jobs were essentially design. My old jobs were, were design. Um, so basically, when I worked at UCSF, I was designing programs, events, communications. So actually, it was amazing how transferable the experiences I had were to my current context. Um, and it was actually really empowering to learn how to overlay those experiences with research and ideation. It was actually, I was doing a lot of the output of design without the process, so it was actually a huge relief for me to learn a way of doing it, a process and a method. But I really appreciate what you had to say. I, I, I think we all have design in us, so whatever background we bring to it is helpful. And again, I think having those diverse backgrounds is super important to, to what we accomplish and what we do. So we actually look for people like me who don't have traditional backgrounds and it works out every single time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you so much. A salva de palmas para Andrew Coffield.